waiting because... <laughs> Very good. So today we have prepared a series of small talks. Uh, some of them will be done by people who are friends of the program or parts of the program or have founded the program. And then the more important talks will be done by five of our fellows that will be happening later. Um, so I don't want to make the ceremonial part of this too long. So without further ado, uh, we would like to welcome the first speaker, which is Sebastian Vollmer. Good afternoon. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Good afternoon and welcome. This is the final presentation of the Data Science for Social Good program 2019. It's great to see so many of you here coming from a broad range of backgrounds, academia, industry, and the third sector. When, when I first saw this program at Chicago, what stuck with me was how well thought through the program is and it needed to be brought to the UK. The UK has a, has a strong NGO sector as well as close links between science and government. Who better to champion this than our National Institute for Data Science and AI, the Alan Turing Institute. Together with its founding member, the University of Warwick, who has its motto, excellence with purpose. So for those who don't know me, I'm Sebastian Wormer. I'm an associate professor for mathematics and statistics at the University of Warwick, as well as program director for data study groups at the Alan Turing Institute, as well as the co-director for the health, pro health program. I was convinced after this, but I have had to convince others. <laughs> and um, what had, luckily, what helped was that the goals that the Turing Institute has are very much aligned with the core values of this program. Training the next generation of data science leaders and applying research to the real world are the core of this program. In fact, combining training and delivery in a way that is better, better than doing them separately is really what uh, makes this look so great. The solutions that come out of this, this uh, program are innovative, and using state-of-the-art methodology. Moreover, they help the third sector to make more data-driven decision-making, and thus, uh, of course, foster an earning of innovation within government and the third sector. This is us on the first day. It is a cohort of, nine, uh, of 19 people with diverse backgrounds, gender balance, from the 20s to the, uh, to the 40s, um, uh, from undergraduate to PhD student and beyond, different disciplines, uh, they're different, uh, they came to us with different learning goals, but were united in the, in, the, in the ambition to spend their summer tackling problems that matter with like-minded people. In the summer, the 12 weeks, they received a broad data science training that takes a strong academic base and moves it to being able to deliver data products. Um, this is done by uh, using support of project managers as well as technical, uh, technical mentors. And it's complemented by ethics discussion and a Friday talk series which we shared with our sister site at the Imperial College London. Mo moreover, the pr product uh, delivery was done in close collaboration with the project partners who are, who are here in the room today. And um, there's a continuous, this will be a continuous benefit when these uh, products are deployed. But ha a lot of things happened behind the scenes. So what have, you ha what have you missed? So there are five projects here today, but we had more than 46 candidates. Similarly, the, the cohort of 19 was selected among, among 800 applicants. Setting a pilot up on this scale is not easy. And I'm uh, very grateful th for the su support of the University of Warwick, and particularly the Mathematics and Computer Science Department, as well as, well as the B uh, Warwick Business School, who is kindly hosting us tonight. Also, the Alan Turing Institute, in particular, the A AI program, which focuses on safe and ethical AI, ha has been very supportive, um, as well as our sponsors. We are very grateful for Accenture for uh, uh, um, generous sponsoring and training around bad actors. We are grateful uh, to Microsoft 
for providing cloud credits and without which all this computation couldn't have happened. And also the uh, um, ONS Data Science Campus who have pr provided valuable technical input into this project and a, a, a close partner. So with this help we were, uh, were able to do, to, to, to do, uh, to do this, uh, this pilot and uh, when you listen to the talks by our fellows you will see that it actually was a big success. So what's the take home message? Let's uh, think about our namesake, Alan Turing. He was at once theoretical as well as practical. This is not about publishing papers. It's about making things happen and not just telling, I told you so. Um, Alan Turing um, faced, the, the, faced the societal issues of his time. It included the war and gruesome, homophobic, discriminatory laws that affected him. He didn't just publish a, a paper we can at some point crack the enigma when we have the next Apple uh, computer coming in 50 years time. No, he did a vital contribution as part of a team to actually crack the enigma. And this is um, where we do um, our, our, our step. We have to have our, the obligation to, do, uh, to not just publish, to deliver data products that are make a measurable impact. And, and what's really helpful is the data scientists we've trained for this. They are well-rounded, they are collaborative, they are problem-focused, problem and they are extremely driven. And that you will see in the, in the talks to come. Um, I would I'll give a, sp a special thanks to the uh, DSSG Foundation, to Paul, who is in the room today, as well as um, a, a, a late, who are part of the, uh, of the Data Science for Social Good Foundation. And special and incredible thanks goes to Rahid Ghani, who came up with this program at the University of Chicago and who has been a great mentor to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. I think you Really, we can't thank him enough for bringing this program to the UK. Um, I now welcome to our humble stage, uh, Raid Ghani, who is the founder of Data Science for Social Good. Um, Raid has been along this journey with us. He is an amazing person. Um, you can read about his accomplishments. He was Obama's chief data scientist in 2012. But I think underneath all of that, he's a remarkable teacher. And he's a truly Socratic teacher in that he will continuously ask you why you are doing things <laughs> to the point where it produces the amazing work that you'll see later on today. Welcome, Raid. Thank you, Josh, and, and thank you, Sebastian. I think that I, I, I like the way you described it as opposed to nagging, pushy <laughs> questions about why are you doing this. Uh, it's it's uh, yeah that that's that's you know that's that's good. Um, one thing I, I, I don't have slides. I, Sebastian passed me this, but so I, this is the second time I'm doing this. Um, last week we had an event at Imperial College uh, where I did have a few slides, but I decided not to use them. So this time I thought you know might as well just not put any slides because then they're there and and nobody's paying attention. So. Um, um, welcome everyone, thank you, thank you so much for coming in and supporting the amazing work as uh, both Andrea and Josh said, this is all fluff, right? The, the really interesting stuff is going to happen um, after me, it'll start after me and then we'll continue um, for about half an hour where you, you'll see some amazing presentations about the work they've been doing. So that's the exciting stuff. What Sebastian and I are doing kind of setting it up to, to tell you about what you're not going to see, right? And, and um, What's amazing about this program and, and what's really hard about this program is it really requires, it sounds really easy. You know, you get uh, uh, 20 people, you give them some projects, you mentor them and they produce amazing presentations and projects and code and, and impact. The reality is much, 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 much uh, more, more difficult, right? It requires a lot of people who both have the skills um, and the, the passion because it requires both in any one of them is a failure, and, and, and so we've got an amazing team this summer that has really made this possible, so I'm very thankful for, for all of them. Um, and same for the teams that have done this for the last six summers, right? So when we started this program seven summers ago, 
the, the motivation was we wanted to really, um, th there were sort of few things happening at that time, right? One was, um, as is true today, in those days it was the data analytics hype, now it's the AI hype. Um, but there was this hype around the use of data, use of evidence-based work, and unfortunately it was only large corporations that were taking advantage of that. And we sort of wanted to figure out why that is, and we kind of came up with three hypotheses. One was, um, for a lot of governments and NGOs, they didn't really know what they could do with, with, with data and machine learning and AI. Um, because when they would read, you know, Wired or BBC, it would only be about how Google uses AI to do something, or if it's government, how's it used for surveillance and scary things as opposed to helping people. Um, so they didn't really have use cases from their peers. Um, but once they figure out what they wanted to do, they didn't have access to people. They didn't have enough people who they could work with. And if they had an idea what they could do and they had people, they didn't really have tools and methodologies because a lot of the off-the-shelf tools were customized, um, again, for large corporations, right? So if a retail retailer wants to go figure out how to do pricing, they buy a pricing optimization tool and they tune it. If a telco wants to figure out which customers are going to leave, they buy a churn management tool and they tune it. And large consulting companies do a lot of that tuning. If a government agency has the same problem, if uh, a, 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 a government agency providing social services needs to figure out which of their clients aren't going to come back to them next week so they can do proactive outreach to, to keep them as clients and keep them engaged. They don't go buy a tool and tweak it. They hope somebody helps them. Uh, they don't even know how to describe their problem that way. And I think that was the initial motivation to see, can we take people who have skills um, that are critical in solving these problems connect them with organizations who have these needs and mentor them and train them to, to create a lot of these use cases, to create these prototypes, um, and to create well-rounded, as Sebastian was saying, individuals who not only care about these problems but have the skills to, to solve them. And then at, while doing that, create methodologies and tools that are all open source that can be reused by project partners, right? And, and what we, what sort of distinction you'll see as they talk about these projects is it's not the relationship between DSSG and the organizations we work with is not that of a client um, delivery model, right? We're not, they're not giving us a problem, we're solving it and giving it to them. It's a partnership model where we're both working together. They're helping us teach the fellows how to work on these projects and we're helping them tackle a problem that's really important, that's really impactful that they're already solving to some extent, but we could help them do it much, much, much better. So that's sort of the, that's the background for what's happening about what you're gonna, what you're gonna hear about are, are, are the very clean, nicely defined problems that come across. So of course that's how you would solve it. Um, <laughs> but if you went through the whole process of, you know, the starting uh, to, to now, that was a very different, very different process. Um, so that's what, the other thing I wanna mention is the, the, the summer is, in some ways, just because our academic system is structured that way, it's an artificial 12 weeks, right? Things start and things finish in, in these 12 weeks. Um, and so a lot of these projects, or none of these projects actually get f finished, right? None of these problems are gonna be solved in 12 weeks. Um, and so most of this work, we wanna try and continue, right? So in the past, we've, we, we take projects that, that start in the summer, we show that they actually can be tackled by these organizations, and then we try to continue them as much as possible. And so I'm gonna give you a couple examples of what that continuation looks like. Of course, that continuation needs you know, resources and support, um, but if you have that, so, so, so for example, one of the projects we started a few years back in the US, by the way, all projects that we do are really depressing, right? Because public policy is really depressing. You're trying to, to deal with issues that are, that, that are depressing and our role is to sort of try to help people who are trying to solve these problems. So one of the depressing problems that's, it's not a big deal over here. Luckily um, in the States, it's, it's a much, much, much bigger issue which, which is police violence, right? I, you've, I'm sure you've all heard about it. So we started a project about three, four years ago as one of the summer projects in DSSG where we worked with several police departments to help them identify police officers that were at risk of doing things they shouldn't be doing. Shooting people, injuring people, any sort of violence. Um, and the idea was that if we can help the police departments identify those officers, 
they can then prioritize them for different types of interventions. It could be training, it could be counseling, it could be a cool down period. For example, we found that two of the big indicators were um, repeated dispatch to domestic abuse cases, um, especially involving children, or repeated dispatches to suicide attempts. And, and in the near term after that, they became high risk of doing things they shouldn't have been doing. And those are sort of stress indicators where you could think about different interventions. So what that started, that started off as we didn't know that was a problem we could even solve, we could even tackle, which would even make an impact. But we tr started that in, 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 in 2015 um, and worked with one police department to, to show that it was doable. We then extended that in the next summer with another police department. We then ended up running trials and then implementing that inside those police departments. And then we licensed it to a startup, which was turning that into a product so it could scale and be used by multiple police departments. Um, another example very s in, in a different area, which we're kind of in the middle of, is a project we started again a couple of years ago as a summer project, like you're going to hear about. Um, and that was around um, looking at criminal justice, uh, which again, uh, U.S. has a pretty terrible record of, um, where there was a county that wanted to reduce their recidivism rate coming into jail. Um, one of the depressing, one of the many depressing things about the criminal justice system in the states is that it, most of the people who are in jails have mental health issues, most of them, 65%, um, have substance abuse disorders, have chronic illnesses. And there's a lot of evidence that shows that those issues um, are Jails are not designed to deal and help with those issues. So what, and they often cause them to go back to jail. And so one of the things we ended up working with this, with, with the county was to help them figure out how do I reduce the recidivism rate with mental health interventions as, as, their, as an outreach method. So if this person needs mental health outreach and if I can give that to them before they come back to jail, could that re improve their outcomes in life as well as reduce the recidivism rate for their population? And so, as a DSSG project, in year one, we, we did a prototype and we found that yes, it's actually the people who are gonna come back are actually identifiable. So the second step was to see, well, great, I can predict who's gonna be at risk of coming back to jail, but who cares if I'm just predicting and watching it happen, right? The idea is to reduce that. So the next step was to see if I intervene on those people with this proactive mental health outreach, does it reduce their risk of coming back to jail? And we just launched a pilot, um, a, a field trial, it's a randomized field trial that started in June, where every month we're giving this uh, organization a list of people um, who they're going out and doing outreach. And we're measuring the reduction in recidivism rate over the next 12 months um, to show that it actually, to, to, and, and we the hypothesis that it works, but we don't know, right? Um, and, and we'll find out over the next, you know, it's about nine months left, nine months left to figure out whether it has a, a reduction in recidivism rate. So the reason I'm telling you this is kind of think of the projects that, that you're going to hear about as an initial prototype that shows that this is actually feasible. Because none of these organizations, or most of these organizations, haven't tried doing this before. A lot of them haven't even looked at their data. Um, and what these fellows have already done is, is define the problem. That's, that's often the hardest. Formulate it in a way that now you can use data and machine learning and AI methods to, to tackle them. And then given a prototype, um, with, with code documentation, which is perfectly documented, everything is structured. They'll show it to you right after the, their talks. Um, and, and what we want to do is then take this, validate it, put it in a trial, and see, confirm that it actually has impact, and then help them implement and deploy it, and then help that scale that to other organizations who have essentially very similar problems. And so in order to do that, one of the things we, we decided to do this year after running this program at University of Chicago for, for many, many years, we collaborated with um, uh, a NOVA School of Business and Economics in Lisbon to run a, a program there. And then out of that, we decided this year to collaborate with two, two places in, in the UK. So we had a program going at Imperial College that finished last, last week. And then this is the second one um, with uh, the Turing Institute and University of Warwick um, to see how, how do these types of programs scale to to new places. Um, and to sort of support more of that, we launched a foundation, as, as um, Sebastian was saying, the Data Science for Social Good Foundation, that's designed 
to really expand these types of efforts. It's designed to help organizations, universities that are trying to run these programs, um, to create training programs, to incubate new ideas and methods and tools that are really needed for this work. Um, and then to create a community just like this, um, to really do more of this. Right? And so there are a few things we're, 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 we're launching that I also talked about last week. Um, one is we're launching kind of in the TEDx model, we're launching these DSSGX chapters that are gonna be affiliates that, that, that have to kind of share our mission of doing social good, uh, of openness, of collaborativeness, uh, and of doing these projects ethically um, because it's, 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 it's too risky if we don't. Right. And, and we already have a few, few of these chapters starting up. We have some in the US, we've got several in Europe, including here and, and Berlin, and then some in, in South America and Australia that we're talking to. So those DSSGX chapters give local universities, cities, groups, a way to connect with the different types of activities that are going on and support each other as well as, as, as liaison with us. The second thing we, we launched very softly last, last year was this Solve platform, which allows people to do work this type of work virtually um, by organizations who can, who can submit projects that they're interested in and volunteers can come help tackle these problems. Very similar to other platforms that exist in different areas, um, but more focused towards um, AI, machine learning, and social good projects. Um, and then we're also gonna be running more of these, more of these types of programs, programs next year. And so to, to finish, <laughs> too many things. Um, the, the last thing I'm gonna say is, you know, it's wonderful that you're here you're clearly interested in, in these topics, right? You're clearly uh, interested in, you're not here um, only for the view, which is very well obscured. Uh, as Josh mentioned, you know, the blinds might go up when they hear me talking uh, about them. But I, I, I wanna sort of, you know, what I'm, what last, last week I was focusing on all the people who are doing, you know, banking and internet and search and all the, the time they're wasting in their life. They should not do that and do something useful instead. Um, but I'm not gonna say that this time. Uh, <laughs> uh, instead what I'll say is, you know, hopefully these, these presentations will, will both tell you how, how talented the people who've been working on these projects are, not just the five you're gonna hear about, but also the other, other 14 and then the other 19 who were here uh, last week. Or, um, but also, hopefully they motivate and inspire you to, to get involved. Um, and, and there are lots and lots and lots of opportunities to get involved. Um, you can, of course, quit your um, jobs if they're not very useful. Um, and, and, and ask us uh, how you can help. But you can also do it in your, in your free time. You can also take time off. So you can get involved through a DSSGX chapter. You can get involved through being a mentor, project manager in, in, our, in our programs. You can get involved. Um, so come talk to us afterwards if you're interested in, in these types of projects and this type of work because it's extremely rewarding. Um, and I do it because I'm really selfish. I like doing them. I, I like working with organizations who are actually doing useful things. And if I can help them a little bit, um, selfishly, I feel good about, about doing that. So thank you very much. Thanks for coming here and supporting us. And come talk to any of us afterwards if you're interested in, in being more involved. So thank you. Thank you both. As far as the warm-up acts go, two of you have been excellent. <laughs> uh, but now for the real deal. Uh, we have five of our 19 who will be talking to you about the projects they have done this summer alongside their fellows, alongside their partners who are here, who have joined us from as far as, as, far, as far away. Um, <laughs> And I hope that you take these presentations as a conversation starters for some, as something that will continue afterwards where you will see the posters, where you get to speak to all of the fellows and anybody else that might be interesting to you in this room. All of you are here for very good reasons because you are interested in, in the work that we have done this summer. And without talking too much, I would like to welcome to the stage Tammy Tsang, who will be talking about the project that she has done. Good afternoon, thank you guys for being here. My name is Tammy and I'm part of a team that worked this summer with the West Midlands Combined Authority to understand and reduce inequity in public transport access. So we're all familiar with public transit delays. You guys may recall this one, it happened earlier this month. I personally missed a lecture because of these power cuts. Maybe you missed an important meeting or getting home in time for dinner with your family. 
For most of us, it was an inconvenient disruption in an otherwise normal day. But for other people, the consequences of public transit failure can be much more serious. Say that you're somebody trying to get to the hospital for a medical appointment, or that you need to get to a job interview, but you don't own a car. Then what do you do when the bus breaks down? As you can see, for some people, public transit access is not just a matter of convenience, but of necessity. And for the people I just mentioned, the people who don't have a backup option can't just call an Uber when the bus breaks down to get to the hospital or job interview. These are people who tend to already be disadvantaged. And so public transit access is especially important for them because failures in the system only further marginalize them. So if I were a transport planner, I'd be asking, who are these people? Where do they live? And how does the current public transit system serve them? I'm not a transport planner, but Helen is. Helen is the head of transport policy at our partner, West Midlands Combined Authority. They're the person, sorry, the people we have been working with this summer. They have <coughs> power over the economic development and regeneration of West Midlands County, including public transportation. One of the problems that Helen and other policymakers often face is that the people who need policy change the most usually have the quietest voices. They don't have a seat at the table, and so policymakers can't see or hear their concerns, and existing inequities in the system only continue to be perpetuated. So our goal this summer was to help Helen and her team find the people who are left out of the current system and give them visibility through data. So what's currently stopping them from doing this? One answer is that they lack informative access metrics. Without a clear idea of how people can get to different places, there's no way to see how access varies between different groups and therefore no way to see or fix inequity in the system. And this is where our team comes in. This summary, we use data to help them solve this problem, starting with asking the question, what is an informative metric of access? Informative should mean something that reflects the lived reality of trying to travel from place to place. And so the first dimension of this metric is that it should be destination-based. When I get on a bus, I'm not getting on trying to randomly go anywhere. I'm getting on with a very specific purpose and destination in mind. So informative metrics of access take the form of, can an elderly person get to a hospital? or can an unemployed person get to a job center? The second dimension is that travel has many different costs. So we want to know things like, how far does an elderly person have to walk to the bus stop to get to a hospital? How long does it take a single parent to travel to a childcare center? Or how much does it cost an unemployed person to get to the job center? We calculated these metrics across the West Midlands, and we built a dashboard that lets Helen and her team answer questions just like these. Let me walk you through an example. This is Falls Hill Road. It's a neighborhood in Coventry near where the fellows are based this summer. It's known to have a high immigrant population and we've come to know it as our go-to place for authentic Indian food. <laughs> so what can we learn about Falls Hill Road through our dashboard? First, our dashboard displays a heat map of a selected population. So here we've selected people born outside of the UK, and you can see that Falls Hill Road is lit up in bright yellow, which means that it confirms our intuition that there's a high concentration of immigrants living here. Secondly, our dashboard displays a heat map of transit access. Here, we're looking at travel time to the nearest job center as our metric and destination of access. And now Falls Hill Road is in dark blue, which means that for people living in this neighborhood, it takes a really long time to get to the nearest job center by public transit. We make this really visible by adding a third heat map, which visualizes neighborhoods that both have a high population of immigrants as well as poor access to job centers. So now Helen can look at this map and say, maybe Falls Hill Road is a good place to start if we want to add new bus lines or add more express buses. And this is just one of many questions that Helen and her team can ask. Asking how expensive it is to get to different places can lead to fare scheme changes. Asking how access varies for different demographic groups can lead to infrastructure improvements in the neighborhoods where these groups live. And asking what happens to access when we add new bus routes or change policy can provide a benchmark for scenario planning. The long-term impacts of our project are that we hope to encourage rigorous evaluation of potential projects. We hope to encourage evidence-based policymaking, both in transport and beyond. And the fact that our tool is open source and uses open data means that this can be easily scaled by other transit authorities. But most importantly, our tool gives those who are left out visibility through data. 
And this means that no groups are left out when new transit is built, both in the West Midlands and hopefully in many other places to come. My name is Tammy, and this summer I worked with Ejay, James, Renja, Andrea, and Adolfo, and we are really excited to show you our dashboard and answer your questions after this. Thank you. Children in social care are some of the most vulnerable people in society. There are many complex situations which lead to a child ending up in social care or no longer being able to live with their families. Sometimes it's because of the short-term illness of a parent or because of temporary situation in the family, but often the issues that result in a child requiring alternative care are more serious or long-term. These are the top four reasons in the UK. It's really important that when we remove children from circumstances such as these, that they receive the care that they deserve. Foster care provides children with a home while they're unable to live with their own families. And this is the most common type of social care. These children, whether it's, for an, whether it's overnight, for a couple of weeks, or for a number of years, these children are placed with carers who can provide them with the support and the stability in a safe, loving environment that can make huge difference to their childhoods. Independent fostering agencies are the bodies, organizations that oversee these homes and ensure that these children are receiving the care that they deserve. Our partner, Ofsted, is the organization that performs the vital function of overseeing this relationship between agencies, homes, and children, and ensuring that those agencies have all the support they need in perform performing their role. Ofsted achieves this by regulating and inspecting these agencies, and currently they inspect these agencies every three years. Due to limited resources, Offset inspectors are assigned to a number of agencies, and for these agencies, they receive incoming information through notifications, which are mandatory messages that agencies send Ofsted when an event, event relating to a child occurs, such as a child getting injured, or if an organizational change occurs, such as a new manager being hired within the agency. They also perform these three yearly inspections where they go and physically visit the premises and ensure that the quality is high. However, offset inspectors are receiving tons of information and sometimes that's distributed across multiple systems, making it hard for any one person to digest all this information. And so, although an inspector could decide to move this, this three-year inspection forward in time, often there's so much data coming in that it's hard to know which agencies that might be necessary for. And in the case that this is done, it's because something has already occurred, such as a notification being received that could be considered serious. And the sooner that Offset's able to reach these agencies that require additional support and oversight, the easier it is to tackle the issues that they're facing. And so Offset approached us and together we tackled some of these issues by building a, building a system that allows them to sooner find those agencies which have the greatest need for additional support and oversight and thereby we ensure that all children receive the greatest foster care at all times. We were able to build this model because we were using a, over a decade's worth of various data sources such as the past inspections, these incoming notifications, annual surveys, changes in management <coughs> to learn from these judgments and past experience of Ofsted's inspectors. And using such a model we can summarize this huge amount of incoming data, both historical and this like, present incoming flow of information, to provide Ofsted with a prioritized list of agencies that we think should be visited sooner, thereby acting as an early warning system to allow them to be more proactive in seeing the agencies that require their help most. If Ofsted currently inspects 70 agencies and finds that 10 of those do not meet their standards, with the model that we developed, we look at all agencies and all data for all those agencies, prioritize a list, and using the same number of resources, we inspect 70 and find 19 that would require additional help. Thereby finding, so, sorry, we find 19 and we find nine additional that could use that support. And with a median of 50 children per agency, 
This means that over six months, 450 children are, are with carers who are providing the, the exact right care and quality of support that they need. And over the, long time, over the long term, what this means is that by efficiently allocating inspectors where the improvement is needed most, we can ensure that foster agencies are providing the essential functions of training, supporting these foster carers. And above all, this means that children have better outcomes and that we can ensure better childcare across England. My name is Annika, and this summer I've had the great pleasure of working with Joby, Viviana, Jared, Josh, Adolfo, and our partners at Ofsted. We're super excited about the work that we've done, and we hope that you come and speak to us afterwards. Thank you. <coughs> Let's consider a scenario. You're going to the doctor. You've been drinking a lot of coffee recently, say for like the last 12 weeks that you've been in the UK doing a summer fellowship program. <laughs> right, like this is just a hypothetical. Um, but you're worried that all this coffee you've been drinking is gonna lead to some bad health consequences. So you ask your doctor about it. Have you ever stopped to think how your doctor actually knows the answers to questions like this? Yes, your doctor went to school for a long time. And yes, they learned a lot while they were there. But it's not as if research stops when your doctor leaves school. In fact, thousands of papers are being published every day. How does your doctor stay up to date with all of the research they need to answer your questions? That's where our partner Cochrane comes into play. Cochrane is a nonprofit organization powered by some 37,000 volunteers located all over the world. Together, Cochrane and its volunteers write systematic reviews of medical research. Think of them like this magnet. They look through all of medical research, they extract the pieces of information that are needed to answer one particular question, and then they synthesize this information and push it out into digestible guidance that doctors and other healthcare professionals can use to inform their practices. Systematic reviews are a key tool that these people use to stay up to date. But putting together these systematic reviews can take a long time. Within Cochrane, it can take up to three years to actually publish one. So why is this? Well, these systematic reviews are on very particular medical questions. Cochrane maintains over 7,500 different reviews, and each of them are on a different question. When you're looking for papers that are relevant for one of these reviews, it's really like trying to find a needle in a haystack. However, Cochrane has a commitment to be very systematic about the search process it uses to find papers for these reviews. The cost of missing a paper with a piece of information about the treatment that's right for you is much higher than the cost of a volunteer spending a few extra hours sifting through more papers. So we worked with Cochrane this summer to think about how we can speed this process up so that doctors get new information sooner. But before we do this, we have to think a little bit about how review authors go about updating these reviews. Typically, review authors will conduct a manual, laborious process of executing a number of different searches across a number of different platforms and then we'll look through the results and find the papers that are going to be relevant for their review. However, these reviews also fall under one of Cochrane's 54 review groups, and each of these review groups oversees one broad medical topic area. Instead, if we knew which review group all of these medical papers fell in, then review authors could look at just one source to find the papers that are relevant for them. But when new papers are published, we don't have this information available. So our work this summer was on classifying these medical research papers into review groups so that it's easier for review authors to find the papers they need to update their reviews so that we can get, so that we can get information into the hands of doctors sooner. <coughs> so how do we actually go about doing this? Well, these medical research papers have a lot of information and we think that there are a couple of areas in particular that we can use to help us with this task. For one, the titles and abstract of these papers have a lot of keywords and phrases that we can use to help distinguish between papers. We can also look at a paper citations. If one paper cites another paper that already belongs to one of these review groups, then there's a good chance that that paper will also belong to that review group. Using features like these about papers, we can predict when Cochrane gets a new set of papers which review group they'll belong to. Now, for the folks that oversee these Cochrane review groups, rather than having to look through all of the papers, we can help them prioritize their workload a little bit. 
for the average review group, we can say that 1% of papers are definitely going to belong to that review group. So they don't have to spend time looking at those papers. We can also say that 77% of papers are not going to belong to that review group, so they don't have to spend their time looking at those papers either. Instead, we can focus their efforts on the 22% of papers that we're not quite sure about. This way, we make the best use of their expertise and time and allow them to keep their review group up to date faster. And by keeping review groups up to date, we make it easy for review authors to find the papers that they need to update their reviews this enables review authors to write their reviews faster and to get this information into the hands of doctors in a more timely manner so that doctors can answer questions like, what is all that caffeine doing to you? <laughs> Thanks, everyone. I'm Anthony. This summer, I had the great, great pleasure of working with Kim, Nishant, Pablo, and Andrea, and we really hope you'll come find us afterward and talk to us more about the work that we did with Cochrane this summer. One bed in a hospital, tables and chairs in schools, and highways. What do these things have in common? Public procurement. <laughs> That's the purchase of goods and services by the government to serve the citizens. But if left unregulated, things can go wrong. And money from taxpayers is lost, but also it can lead to extreme consequences, such as this one. It happened in Paraguay some years ago. A school folded down because of the use of other standard materials. Very often, we observe these bad outcomes, but it's already too late. So our partner is the DNCP, that's the national agency in Paraguay that regulates all the procurement processes in the country. And its aim is to avoid these bad outcomes. So the DNCP wants to be more proactive and better regulate all the procurement process at the very earliest stage, so that it leads to less corrupt practices and at the end, they will serve the citizens with better public goods and services. So what is the main challenge that the NCP faces? They receive 10,000 procurements per year, and they have 30 people in their staff to manually review them and come up with a conclusion whether a procurement is irregular or not. They use all their experiences, all their knowledge to come up with this conclusion in a three-day window. But sometimes they will receive complaints pointed out that the procurement was irregular, but this was not caught during the reviewing process. So this is the problem that the DNCP has. They miss some irregularities. They also waste time and effort reviewing procurements that were OK. Plus, they have some bias, as the complaints are more concentrated on the high value procurements. So what's the solution and how the solution works? It, cont it contemplates all the DNCP past experiences plus new features. So we combine all the human learnings with the power of machine learning to come up with a solution. But let's see how this actually works. This is the process they have now. But with the solution we built together with the DNCP, we managed to get a prioritized list of all the procurements based on the likelihood of containing an irregularity. So now the reviewer can focus first on the most risky ones. And also, he or she has some guidance on where exactly to look up for the anomaly that needs to be corrected. So what data did we use to make this solution? The DNCP has data on 130,000 procurement processes about what's the agency that wants to buy these public goods and services, what's the price of these public goods and services, did they receive a complaint or not at the end, etc. Plus, more than one million pages of documents related to the, all of these procurements. And this data contemplates 10 years of procurement history in Paraguay. So how many irregularities do we cut with this solution? Now they review on a first-come, 1st first side basis. And by doing this, they're able to capture up to 30% of the bad outcomes in advance. But with the new solution, we will be able to prioritize a list based on the likelihood of containing an irregularity. And with this, they can focus on the most li risky ones. And we will be able to capture 80% of the bad outcomes in advance. And not, o not only that, they can, all they can also concentrate on the bias that is in the complaints and be more fair in the reviewing processes. So the solution now 
reduces the emissive irregularities, also reduces the wasted time and effort on reviewing procurements that were okay, plus reduces the bias toward reviewing more carefully only the high value procurements. What's the impact of this solution? The solution can turn the tables on corruption because for the first time it is the regulators that are one step ahead of the process and now they can, pre they can prevent corruption before it becomes a tragedy. Secondly, it is more fair. Now the most expensive procurements are more scrutinized than the lower value ones. But with the solution, we make sure that the lessons learned from the high value corruption cases are also used to understand the problems in the smaller procurements. And last but not least, it's increased accountability because now the agencies will be more responsible for better quality procurements. In the case of Paraguay, with GDP is $4 billion, 10% is spent on public procurement. And out of that, 3% is lost due to corruption or irregularities. This means that with our solution, we estimate that we could potentially save for Paraguay $90 million per year. And with this money, Paraguay could build six hospitals, or 600 schools, or 500 kilometers of road. So thank you very much for your attention. My name is Maria. This is the team, Joao, Wen, Ana, Pablo, Josh. And this is our partner, Pablo and Juan from the DNCP. Thank you very much for your attention. Every night, 4,700 people are forced to sleep rough on the streets in England because they do not have access to a shelter or home to stay in. What makes this number even worse is that it has more than doubled since 2010. So let's say you're walking home one night and you come across someone who is rough sleeping. You would like to help them, but maybe you don't have any food <coughs> or cash on hand or you're not sure what they need in this situation. Our partner Homeless Link has a solution and all it takes is your mobile phone. So Homeless Link is a charity membership organization working to end homelessness in England and Wales. One way they are working to do this is through their platform called Streetlink. Streetlink can be accessed through a mobile phone, through a website, and through a landline. And members of the public, as well as rough sleepers themselves, can create an alert about someone who is rough sleeping, with the goal being that a local service provider is able to locate that rough sleeper and provide them with any necessary assistance, such as taking them to a shelter. So let's say you created an alert on that rough sleeper that you saw. On that alert, you would put information such as the gender, the age group, a description about what they were wearing, as well as where they are located. That location information was used to create the plot behind me, which shows where all 280,000 alerts that have been created at Streetlink originated. What would happen next is a volunteer staff member at Streetlink would then review your alert to see if there's enough information to where if they sent out a local service provider, they think they could find that rough sleeper. If it meets that criteria, they turn it into what is called a referral. And a referral is actually what is sent to the local outreach team and is used to try to find that rough sleeper. Ultimately, a person is either found or not found. So you can see how not every alert turns into a referral and not every referral ends in that person being found. And that brings us to the problem that we worked on this summer. So of the 280,000 alerts that Streetlink has received, only 14% of those have resulted in that person being found. And part of the reason for this problem is that manual review process that Streetlink volunteers and staff members have to go through in order to assess the quality of each alert before turning it into a referral. This is especially difficult during the winter months or during a storm where Streetlink can receive over a thousand alerts in a given a day. And they don't have any way of prioritizing these alerts or knowing which one should be turned into a referral without manually digging into each one. By the time they get to a high quality alert at the bottom of the list, it might have been created days ago and that rough sleeper is no longer there. So the way that we worked on solving this problem was we worked with Homeless Link and we shadowed Streetlink volunteers so that we understood their process. And we used the information on these alerts, again including the data such as the gender, the descriptions about their appearance and location. And we built a model that would generate a prioritized list of alerts based on the likelihood that that rest sleeper would be found. <coughs> this way, the highest quality alerts are at the very top of the list and can quickly be turned into referrals by the Streetlink team. We created a solution 
that was efficient, effective, and equitable. So when our model is used to push out the same number of referrals as StreetLink's current process, it leads to an increase in 18% in the person found rate. By having a prioritized list of alerts for StreetLink to review, high quality alerts can more quickly be turned into referrals, keeping that information more up to date, potentially leading to more rest sleepers being found. This also frees up valuable resource time at the StreetLink office that can be used to look at referrals across demographics as well as locations previously not explored in order to challenge any existing biases in StreetLink's current process, making our solution more equitable. We believe that our project will have an impact both on an individual ref sleeper level as well as the ref sleeper population as a whole. By better connecting ref sleepers to local service providers, we can minimize the amount of time that someone spends in the vulnerable position of having to sleep on the street. In addition, the data analysis we can give Homeless Link can be used in their yearly conversations with the UK government in order to impact positive policy change to reduce the problem of ref sleeping in England. Thank you very much. My name is Zoe, and this summer I got to work with Lucia, Austin, Harry, uh, Josh, and Adolfo, and we really enjoyed our time here and are really excited to talk more about with you after. Thank you. So I'm sure you'll all agree with me that that was an absolutely incredible array of projects. It was, of course, just a taster. So you'll have the chance to talk to everyone in depth about how these solutions work, the kind of trials and tribulations that they've gone through in the last three months to bring these solutions to the partners. Um, and all of that will take place very shortly. Uh, before we do that, we have um, a few remarks from the Institute Director and Chief Executive of the Alan Turing Institute, who's been our host for a large part of this summer. So on behalf of uh, the Turing Institute, we are ultimately a national institute in data science and AI, ultimately for the public and social good. Uh, we have within Turing uh, what we call a public policy program, and I think, going back to, to Raid, we, we may be in a better situation than the states in that we are in constant conversation with government, and I really do think uh, we can make influence. However, that's mainly national government and local government and NGOs and that kind of outreach. I think this kind of activity is an incredibly valuable addition uh, to our portfolio. Uh, so let me say thank you to everybody, in, uh, in particular Raid, but awful lot of the work that goes on behind the scenes is not very glamorous and it drives people into great stress and angst. And having witnessed Sebastian's stress and angst over the previous months, I think in particular if we could thank him for all his efforts in this day. <laughs> So where do we go from here? Um, I think it's implicit in what I've already said that Turing is absolutely committed to everything we can do in general for public and social good. Uh, what can we bring to bear? We are a partnership at the moment of 13 universities and others. We can bring to bear incredible academic firepower. Uh, but we also have a strong brokering and convening power and quite a lot of influence. Our public policy team, when they put up their slides of activities, literally hundreds of interactions with policy making and policy implementing officials. So I think in this space, we're merely beginning to scratch the surface and we can do incredible things going forward. And I will do everything I can as director of Turing uh, to keep us in this loop and to move forward as we go through uh, future activities. But we can't do this on our own. This is very much a partnership kind of model. Part of the partnership is challenges and ideas. We need those. But we also ultimately need resources. So anybody who has access to resource, intellectual or otherwise, you know where we live. Um, 
Turing appeared a little earlier, and some of you may have noticed that we succeeded in getting Turing to be the face on the new 50 pound note, which will come into existence in 2021. But we need a hell of a lot of 50 pound notes to carry out this activity. So I look forward to receiving your checks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, so a few additional thanks along the line there. So Turing has been our host, but also the University of Warwick has obviously hosted us and given us premises which we've occupied nearly 24 hours a day um, and fueled by a uh, taste of Vietnam, Vietnamese food. Um, we also have had a sister program this summer at Imperial College of London, and we've had Friday seminars with amazing speakers at that university as well. And some of the fellows from that program are in the audience today. So if you want to speak to them, you really should and hear about a whole nother set of incredible projects that have been done over there. Um, of course, we need to thank the Data Science for Social Good Foundation, people like Paul Van Boer and Lenya Mestrino, um, Raid, of course, who've helped us learn from the experience of previous programs. And finally, the people who you've seen today speak are the spokespersons for teams. So can all of the fellows stand up, please, where you are? Thank you. So these guys have worked tirelessly all summer and they'll be out in the foyer by their posters with all the technical information that you could desire to find out from them. And then the final thanks of course go as well to the technical mentors who've supported these guys to be able to deliver their projects. And also my other half and project manager in this endeavor, Andrea Sipka, who has worn many hats, including the event coordinator for this at the very last minute. Um, there are countless others who've helped, so if we can put together a big hand for everyone who's made this day happen. And, and just as a final comment to follow on from what Adrian said, we've got all kinds of people in this room from not-for-profit sector, from government, from universities, from companies. If you're from the private sector and you'd like to be involved in this, if you're from any of those other sectors and you'd like to be involved in this, if you see these problems that we've presented today and you think, I know an organisation with a problem like that and you want to be involved in this and you want to do something like the amazing projects that you've seen today, please, please, approach any of us and talk to us about how we can make that possible and how we can continue bringing these data science skills to problems that really, really need them. All right. Thank you, everyone. We're serving drinks outside and then food will be served from six and meet each other. Don't be shy. <laughs> Thanks very much.